Okay guys, so we are back with chapter 138 of Eden Zero, which again, just like the last chapter, was pretty much a straight up action, just showing off exactly how much stronger Shiki and the gang are now that they train under Xenolith. And I can understand why Hero felt comfortable putting out these two chapters together now, in the same week, because there's not really much story progression, it's pretty much all just action. So, you know, there wasn't really much for him to do when it came down to like writing out a story, it wasn't really much planning time involved with that. The majority of his time was just spent drawing these cool action shots. And you know what? If there's one thing that Hero draws really well besides edgy shots, it's fights. I mean, he's not on the same level as I would say like an Akira Toriyama or anything like that, but Hero has always done an amazing job of drawing fight sequences. And like I said, there's a reason why he is my number one favorite manga artist. Well, I mean, two reasons. Now, one thing that actually confused me in the last chapter and still kind of confusing me in the beginning of this one, where is Laguna getting all that water from? Like seriously, we see him just throwing waves of water at opponents to wash them away. Where is all that water coming from on a desert planet? Like, I, I really don't understand how he's getting that. I mean, maybe he's creating the water with his ether gear, but last time I checked, he could only manipulate water. He couldn't actually just create it. But, you know, that actually might be the fruit of his labor, you know, from training under Xenolith. He might actually upgrade his ability to the point where he can just create water out of thin air. Just, you know, maybe grab water particles from the air and just use that to attack people with. I don't know. It's just kind of confusing that he's just basically water bending in this chapter on a planet that really shouldn't have much water. And you know what, speaking of Laguna, we actually got a nice combo shot of him and Shiki in this chapter where some flying enemies actually come in. Which, by the way, these guys actually look kind of like robots themselves. But what I'm guessing is they're basically just Imperial soldiers who dressed up in these like flying gear and they actually come in as their aerial assault. And we actually see Shiki jump up in the air and basically just knock them down one after the other, kind of like he's playing pinball with them. And then Laguna uses its waves to basically just wash them away. It's a really cool combo attack and it shows Shiki and Laguna basically being in sync with each other. And this is actually kind of cool to see that because Laguna up until this point has pretty much been distant, almost more distant than Jin has been with the rest of the gang because he doesn't really see himself as being a member of the crew. As far as he was concerned, he was just there until he could actually figure out a planet that he can live safely on, or at least that was a story that he told everyone. Really, he had some kind of secret objective that he was basically keeping to himself. But still, despite being someone who didn't see himself as part of the crew, he's working really well with them in this chapter. So it makes me wonder, you know, maybe he's starting to warm up to them. Maybe he's actually starting to see himself as actually being like an actual member of the team, an actual friend to them. And you know, it's actually not just Laguna starting to see Shiki as a friend. We actually see Goodwin in this chapter starting to turn around on the idea of working together with Shiki and the rest of the Eden Zero crew. Especially once he actually ends up finding out that they actually are from the Eden Zero. Because the Eden Zero ship is actually world famous now, or I guess universe famous now, for defeating Drak and Joe. So he's heard of them, and he's, you know, starting to, after he finds out that they're actually from that ship, he's starting to turn around on the idea of, you know, working with them. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention in the last chapter, good one is built. And when I say built, I mean this guy is gigantic. Like, literally in the last chapter, I forgot to mention it, there's a shot where we see good one in the background while Shiki and Laguna are talking. And this dude is towering over buildings. Like, seriously, this cat was peeking over the building like he's the Colossal Titan. And it's kind of interesting because throughout the chapter, in the last chapter, the chapter before that when he was first introduced, and in this chapter as well, his size seems to differ. And it makes me wonder, maybe his Ether Gear ability is that he's actually able to change his size. Because we know from chapter 135, or no, one cha chapter 136, that he actually is a very strong Ether Gear user. But we haven't seen exactly what his ability is just yet. So maybe that actually is his ability. Maybe he can actually increase and shrink his size at will. We also end up getting a pretty nice shot of everyone who was still on the Eden Zero ship after they defeated some enemies actually went to the other side of the city in order to attack civilians there and basically we see that they already kicked everyone's ass. I kind of wish we would have got to see a little bit of that fight because I'm interested in seeing what Jin and Klein can do now after training under Xenolith and we really didn't get to see them training but I would be interested in finding out if Sister Witch and Hermit also got some kind of power up from Xenolith as well. So after all the Imperial soldiers are defeated, and we actually have the last soldier standing be that little kid that Rebecca saved in the last chapter, who basically just charges all of them by himself and then ends up getting locked up with the rest of the Imperial soldiers. And this is when we actually get another moment showing that Goodwin and the Oasis group are actually the good guys in the situation, because when they actually sit down with the Imperial soldiers, Goodwin actually gets really pissed off because they actually killed 16 of their members. But when the Imperial soldier actually claps back and says, hey, you guys killed people on our side as well, Goodwin calms down and is like, you know what, you're right. We did all this pointless killing it for what? And he says that, you know, we're going to keep you guys held hostage for now. But once this war's over, I hope that we can actually just sit down and have a beer or something. And just kind of like talk things out. And again, him saying this to his enemy and then again being reminded that Poseidon Nero is okay with having children soldiers in his army. Kind of really is starting to paint the idea that the Oasis group and Goodwin are the good guys. And Poseidon Nero really is a dictator. 
And then we cut over to Shore at the end of the chapter, and this part of the chapter actually has me scratch my head to how much Hero actually thought things out. Because, alright, and I'm not going to question Hero, I'm sure that he actually has an idea and a plan in mind. But we got over to, I think, uh, Planet 66, or Planet Narrow 66, and we see Shore just kind of lounging around at some kind of, like, beach resort. And it's him and the Ocean 6 just kind of, like, just hanging out there, just chilling, basically waiting for Ziggy to show up. And while they're waiting there, we have a racer from the Rayshon States uh, Interstellar show up, basically there to arrest Shura, which, I gotta be honest with you, I am not on board with the idea of him showing up there. Because, I mean, one of two things are gonna end up coming from this. Either A, this is gonna be Hero basically kind of weakening Shura for Shiki so that he can defeat him, which will basically show that Shiki's training didn't really result in anything because Shura had to be weakened in order for him to stand a chance against him. Or B, Shura's going to easily defeat Eraser. And I'm really not okay with either option because one, again, showing off that Shiki had to basically defeat Shura after he got defeated or weakened by Eraser just shows that the whole training that he did was enough was kind of pointless. At least the seven days of training didn't really amount to enough. So that kind of shows that Shiki still wasn't strong enough, even though we've been pretty much showing off the entirety of the last three chapters, that Shiki has gotten a lot stronger. So finding out that, you know, his training still wasn't enough to defeat Shura kind of really makes me feel like that the entirety of the training was pointless. But on the other hand, I don't like the idea of Shura defeating Eraser because of the fact that he's an Eraser on Saints Interstellar. And when it comes to the Eraser on Saints, whether it be the Galactica or Interstellar, each time we've been introduced to one of them, they've been extremely OP compared to the, you know, main characters. I mean, look what happened when they picked a fight with Dragon Joe. He wiped the floor with them. Like, Shiki ended up dying, and if it wasn't for Rebecca being able to go back to a different timeline, and basically them figuring out exactly what his weakness was and destroying that machine, Shiki would not have won that fight. And then when Shiki tried to fight Justice, it wasn't even a contest. Justice was easily wiping the floor with Shiki. Like, if it wasn't for LZ showing up and saving Shiki, someone who was actually on par with Justice, then Shiki would have died right then and there. So again, prior to this, each time we've been introduced to a one of the Eurasian states, whether they be Interstellar or Galactica, they've been proven to be overly powerful. And if Eraser is going to be in the same organization or the same grouping, then he has to be extremely powerful as well. And if Shura, the person that Shiki is supposed to be taking out in this arc, is easily able to defeat Eraser, then it kind of makes it seem like he doesn't deserve to be in this grouping. It kind of hinders the idea that maybe Interstellar or the Eraser states Interstellar at the very least really are that powerful. Like maybe it's just an outlier that Justice is actually the most powerful one and the rest of them are kind of just light work. But anyway, we can only just sit back and wait to see exactly how this fight ends up playing out. But that's pretty much it for the video, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, drop me a like. Subscribe to the channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Comment down below your thoughts on the chapter. Uh, like I said in the last video, I don't know if we're going to be getting a chapter next week since we got two this week. But if we do, look forward to a review for that one. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.